We now have the technologies to actually access that blueprint or the code that tells you how to build that animal and actually how you build a thylacine. It was the largest carnivorous marsupial in Australia that lived in modern times. This footage shows the last captive thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger as it's also known, which died in Hobart Zoo in 1936. In 1982, the species was declared extinct. Now, scientists at the University of Melbourne want to bring it back from the dead using its DNA, not just to prove they can, but for critical ecological purposes. You know, ethically, if we have the ability now to bring some of these cornerstone species back, animals that we hunted to extinction, that we really owe it to those animals to try and restore them back, not just for that, that particular species, but for the entire ecosystem that they were a part of. Professor Andrew Pask is a marsupial evolutionary biologist and Tasmanian tiger expert. He's the lead researcher at the newly created Thylacine Integrated Genetic Restoration Research Lab. And the only reason this de-extinction can even be contemplated is because of new gene editing technology. So this is obviously a really grand challenge. You know, this is uh, part of a new area of science called de-extinction science where we now have the technologies to actually do this. So we, we're able to actually access tissue from extinct animals or cells from extinct animals, extract the DNA from those specimens. So that's that, that blueprint or the code that tells you how to build that animal. And we're able to actually now sequence and access that code and read it for the first time and actually start to understand how you build a thylacine basically. There are over 330 species of marsupials in the world, and two-thirds of them live in Australia and New Guinea. The rest live in the Americas, mainly South and Central America, although the Virginia opossum ranges through the US and Canada. Most of us know the iconic marsupials, the kangaroo and koala. They're commonly known as pouched mammals. They give live birth, but don't have long gestation like placental mammals, which include humans. Instead, they give birth and the tiny embryo climbs from the mother's birth canal to the nipples to feed in the pouch. The female thylacine had a back opening pouch and the litter size was up to four. Young were dependent on the mother until they were at least half grown. It looks almost exactly like a wolf or a dog, so incredibly different to any other living marsupial that's around today. So the last animal went extinct in 1936 and it went extinct because when European men first came down into Tasmania, they identified the, the Tasmanian tiger as a predatory animal that was going out and hunting and killing other animals. And they thought that it was uh, going to potentially kill their sheep and they were all wanting to move into these places as big sheep farmers. And so they aggressively went out and hunted this incredible animal to extinction over the course of a very short period of time. So it's this really sad human driven extinction. You know, we still have footage of the Tasmanian tiger. We've got a lot of pictures of the Tasmanian tiger. So was it as predatory as they said? Was it an apex predator? It was an apex predator. So it sits right at the top of the food chain, but it was not able to eat a sheep. So although it has a really big mouth and big jaws, it doesn't have a lot of strength in those jaws and you can very easily measure the size of the musculature or, you know, by looking at skulls from specimens and figure out what its bite force is. So we know based on the size of the jaw and the skull that there's no way it would have been killing and eating sheep. And in fact, on that island of Tasmania, there are tons of small little marsupials, sort of rat sized marsupials running around and that would have been its primary prey. So it's really simple to catch and abundant food sources that are much smaller and its mouth and skull were really designed to be able to chomp and eat those really small little animals. At one time, the thylacine was spread across Australia, even extending to New Guinea. But it was later confined to Tasmania, an island state located 240 kilometers to the south of the mainland. Hence the name Tasmanian tiger. There are still sightings, which is not surprising when it looks so much like a dog. But just like the Loch Ness Monster, there's no proof. So although I'd love to believe that they might still be out there, we lack any scientific evidence to really back that up. Now with the help of a 3.6 million US dollar philanthropic donation, the Tiger Lab, as Professor Pask calls it, is ready to right the wrongs of the past. 
In 2018, you published the first genome sequence of the thylacine. How long did that puzzle take to solve? Yeah, I've been working on it now for 20 years, so it's been a very, very long process. But the technology has, has increased so amazingly that, you know, if I was to undertake this project for the first time, you know, tomorrow, I'd probably be able to do as much as I've done now in a few weeks, right? Like, it's just incredible how much better we are at um, doing this sort of technology. So the problem is with any extinct animal, with any specimen that's been sitting around for a long time or aging in a museum collection, is that that DNA breaks up into lots and lots of tiny pieces. And there's a lot of it in any mammal cell. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, carries the genetic instructions for all known organisms. It's made up of four chemical bases, adenine, A, guanine, G, cytosine, C, and thymine, T. DNA bases pair up with each other. A pairs with T, C pairs with G, forming what's known as base pairs. So marsupials being mammals, they have the same amount of DNA as we have, which is about 3 billion bases or 3 billion letter codes in our entire genome. So these are really, really huge projects to decipher all of those 3 billion letters. The problem is when you're dealing with an extinct animal or an old specimen, is that's broken up into lots of little fragments. These are about 100 letters each, each of the fragments that we have in our thylacine specimen. And that's a specimen that's only been there for about 100 years. So this is much, much more difficult if you're talking about animals that have been extinct for a lot longer. DNA is coiled up into long stretches, known as chromosomes, found in the nucleus of the cell. Each contains hundreds of thousands of genes. The professor and his team needed full-length chromosomes, but they could only reassemble the recovered 100-letter fragments into DNA sequences of several thousand letters at a time. To stitch these together into full-length chromosomes, they took the DNA sequences of the thylacine and lined it up against the chromosomes of the Tasmanian devil, which filled in the missing gaps. Both of these animals belong to a group of marsupials called Dasyurids, renowned for their genetic sequence remaining relatively unchanged over time. So I say it's like doing a puzzle where half of the pieces of that puzzle are blue sky and you've got to try and put all those blue sky pieces back together again. And we don't have a picture on a box, right? Because the animal went extinct, we don't know what the finished thing really should look like. So we kind of have to try and fit all the pieces back together again without that box picture. So it really is a huge task to do. And we can only do it now through these massive advances in DNA sequencing technology, but also having supercomputers that can obviously take all this information, look at all those pieces of the puzzle and figure out how to put them all back together again. But they can't create life where there is none. They still don't have the technology to turn dead cells or the dead genome sequence into a living organism. To do it, they'll need help from another living marsupial. To bring the thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger, back from the dead, Professor Andrew Pask and his team not only need cutting-edge technology, they need help from another, much smaller marsupial. You can't just grow one in a petri dish, so you've got your DNA. What do you do with it now? So what we have to do, the way that de-extinction science works, is you look around in living animals today and try and find a living animal that is the closest relative to your animal that went extinct. So for us with the Tassie tiger, it's actually a really small little mouse-sized marsupial called a fat-tailed dunnart. So they're like a little grey mice with big black eyes, really cute. Um, and they're the closest living relative to the Tasmanian tiger. They are carnivores, obviously not an apex predator being this big, uh, but they'll, they'll certainly try and bite your finger off when you pick them up for sure. So they've got that aggressive spirit in them, which is good. Um, so basically what you have to do then is you sequence the genome of your closest living relative that's alive today. And you compare that to your extinct animal, to your Tasmanian tiger, and you figure out everywhere where there are differences between those two genomes. And then what we do is we go in with our living cells from our fat tail dunnart and we edit in all of the places that they're different in a Tasmanian tiger. So we're essentially turning our dunnart cells now into a Tasmanian tiger cell. And once you've finished doing all of those edits, we can use things like IVF and cloning technologies to turn those cells then 
back into a whole living animal to actually recreate that Tasmanian tiger. Like me, you might have visions of Frankenstein right now, moulding the DNA of one species to another. Will it even look like a thylacine? Well, Professor Pask's research team have created video renders of what they think the thylacine Joey will look like, which is much like the young of every other marsupial. Bald, pink, with pronounced forelimbs and jaws that help it crawl into the mother's pouch. Obviously, we need a surrogate mother. We need a way to figure out how to gestate this baby. And we don't know how lots of the parts of this technology that we're applying is going to impact what that final animal actually looks like. We know what they should look like from archival footage and photographs, but we will see as we go through this process if we can actually get to that point of recapitulating or recreating that exact thylacine, and we think we can. One of the great things about marsupials in terms of having a surrogate mum is we can actually use that tiny little dunnart, that mouse-sized dunnart, to uh, rear or be the surrogate mother for a Tasmanian tiger. And that's because marsupials give birth to tiny, tiny little babies. So even a really small marsupial can give birth to one that's gonna grow quite large. In fact, this group of marsupials to which the Tasmanian tiger belonged and the Dunnart, their babies on the day of birth are about the size of a grain of rice. They're about that big and not even your big basmati grain of rice. We're talking like an arboreo grain of rice. Those little short grain rice is about the size of their babies on the day of birth. So even that tiny little marsupial can give birth to a Tasmanian tiger. And then you can rear it, because once it's born, they just drink milk from the, the mother's teeth, just like other mammals do. So it's possible to hand rear them even from a very early stage of development. Now, how that's gonna impact the animal's behavior when they grow up, they should reach their full normal size as we can hand rear them. And we know that we can do this with other marsupials. We can take them out of the pouch very early. We can hand rear them on milk and it doesn't have any impact on them. But in terms of their behavior and the way that they interact, they're not gonna be raised by another Tasmanian tiger. But there are most of the behaviors are pre-programmed in animals' brains, particularly things like being an apex predator and hunting behavior. These are behaviors that are really hardwired. So we think all of that should be fine. And uh, there are also behaviors that you can also train animals if they lack those abilities. So, you know, we can hand rear orphaned animals all the time, wolves and other sorts of apex predators, and they will inherently take on those normal behaviours. And if not, you can actually train them to have it. Not everyone is happy with this project, but Professor Pask doesn't see it as playing God. Rather, he wants us to look at the big picture, putting certain species back into the environment so they can carry out the critical role they were playing before man hunted them to extinction. What it really comes down to is thinking about which particular animals we might want to apply this technology to. This is definitely not the solution to us losing animals off the planet. This is just going to be another tool in our conservation toolkit, if you like, to protecting species. And I think they're the kinds of animals that you would want to bring back and really ethically consider the value of returning an animal like that. Because the Tasmanian tiger is the only apex predator we have in Australia. We don't have any other apex predators. It was the only one that we had. It played an absolutely critical role in the ecosystem and it really stabilizes the health of all the animal populations that sit beneath it in that food chain. And so when you lose an animal like that, you start to see really crazy things happening in the environment. And one great example that we've seen, well, it's not a great example, one terrible example that we've seen is with Tasmanian devils. So these are an animal that would sit beneath the Tasmanian tiger in that food chain. And they've recently got this Tasmanian devil tumor disease. And it's like a cancerous tumor and they bite each other's faces and it nearly led to the extinction of the Tasmanian devil. And so what happens when you've got your apex predator in place, when you've got your Tasmanian tiger in that food chain, is they actually pick off and they eat these sick individuals in the population and they remove them, preventing them from spreading this disease so quickly throughout the population. And it's that level of control of picking out these weaker, sicker animals that prevents diseases like this from wiping out entire species. So what's the time frame, Andrew? When might we see a Tassie tiger walking the earth again? So I think it will be about another decade before we have that thylacine cell. And then we're starting that second part of the project of then turning that cell into a living animal. We're working on those parts right now. So hopefully by the time we get our thylacine cell, we've figured out all the other bits about how to turn that cell into a living animal. So we hopefully we'll be ready to hit the ground running. 
But yeah, I think around a decade is really a reasonable time frame to think that we will be uh, are seeing some of these. You know, and we're not the only lab working on de-extinction. There'll definitely be within the next decade, I would think, a, a few different animals that are de-extincted across the globe. So I think this is definitely an interesting space to watch to see, you know, which animals are going to be coming back. And if they do succeed in bringing thylacines back, they would need to be studied for decades in large fenced-off areas before releasing them into the wild. So these are still really, really long studies, and that's why de-extinction is never going to be the solution. You know, we, we still need to first and foremost protect and preserve all of the species that we have around today. We don't want to have to apply this de-extinction technology. We want to keep the species alive exactly as they are. But in circumstances where we have tragically lost those species, I think this is our last resort effort to bring those species back and restore them back into those ecosystems.